So should I earn a pecan? No, that's idolatry. It's a very It is. I love it. Right, ladies and gentlemen, if I could get your attention, please. I think we might make a start. Thank you all for coming. My name is Jonathan Cole. I'm the Acting Executive Director of the Australian Centre for Christianity and Culture. And we're about to hear the next lecture in our Theological Disputes series, which will be given momentarily by the Reverend Dr. Peter Grundy. Before I introduce Peter properly, I of course would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we meet, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Peter, uh, I don't actually have my reading glasses on, so this is going to get interesting. Let me know if I make something up or accident. I like this description Peter has given me. He says he's a retired public servant, an Anglican priest by disposition and service. <laughs> Sounds like there's a whole story there. That Did you say dispossession or disposition? Disposition. disposition. <laughs> and an active philosopher. He's uh, a philosopher, I think it's fair to say, Peter, in the analytic tradition. Absolutely. Q ominous music. He uh, has appointments at both the CSU and ANU, which is hardly surprising for an analytic philosopher. Indeed, he's a uh, adjunct researcher at the Australian Centre for Christianity and Culture. His work, if I could summarise it, focuses on ethics, metaphysics, and religion. And I think the paper he's about to give fits within the area of philosophy of religion. It sounds fascinating. All I know is that it's to do with Rowan Williams and one Ludwig Wittgenstein. So, Peter, that's all I need to say. I, like everyone else, I'm sure are going to hear from you. So, thank you, Jonathan. Please make some welcome. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to particularly acknowledge a couple of Sydney theologians visiting Canberra, Elena Nobbs and Ray Nobbs from Macquarie University. Very welcome. Uh, today I'm going to convince you that Rowan Williams is not Wittgensteinian. Now I hope you're going to be patient enough to realise what the significance of that is. It'll take me the paper to explain it. Uh, but since the notice of this uh, seminar went out, uh, two retired Anglican archbishops have entered into correspondence with me. So in a sense, they've raised the significance of the occasion just a whisker. And uh, in order to acknowledge them, I'm going to bookend my uh, paper uh, with their contribution. So uh, if uh, I may, uh, the first person uh, that I want to bookend my lecture by is uh, Archbishop Peter Carnley who was Archbishop of Perth and Primate of Australia. And uh, upon being notified about my lecture, he wrote in these terms, thanks for your message about Wittgenstein. I'm certainly interested, though in Perth, so I have to be an apology. I would love to receive any follow-up material. I was in Cambridge in the 1960s, so was brought up on Wittgenstein. In fact, for a while, I looked after St. Giles Church in Cambridge during an interregnum. Parish clergy in England have direct custody of church cemeteries, <coughs> and Wittgenstein is buried in St. Giles Cemetery. So, I actually feel quite close to Wittgenstein, having had custody of his body. Cheers, <laughs> Peter. <laughs> To which I replied, the Right Reverend Dr. Peter Carnley, AC. Dear Bishop Peter, it is most pleasing to hear from you as the date for my seminar presentation approaches. I trust that you continue well. Of course, it is a delight to learn of your association with St. Giles Church, Cambridge. I had been unaware of that aspect of your ministry. Although authoritative re reflections were written by G. H. Von Wright and Norman Malcolm, 
in my opinion, the most significant biography of Wittgenstein is Ludwig Wittgenstein, The Duty of Genius, 19, 1991, written by the philosopher Ray Monk. It makes reference to St. Giles and the circumstances surrounding Wittgenstein's death from prostate cancer on the 29th of April 1951 at the Cambridge residence of his doctor, Dr. Edward Bevan. You might appreciate a quote from Monk concerning Wittgenstein's death and burial. Here's a quote from Ray Monk in his biography, Ludwig Wittgenstein. The next day, Ben, that is Wittgenstein's lover, Anscombe, Smithies and Drury were gathered at the Bevan's home to be with Wittgenstein at his death. Smithies had brought with him Father Conrad, but no one would decide whether Conrad should say the usual office for the dying and give conditional absolution until Drury recollected Wittgenstein's remark that he hoped his Catholic friends play, prayed for him. <laughs> this decided the matter and they all went up to Wittgenstein's room and kneeled down while Conrad recited the proper prayers. Shortly after this, Dr. Bevan pronounced him dead. The next morning, he was given a Catholic burial at St. Giles Church, Cambridge. The decision to do this was again prompted by a recollection of Drury's. He told the others, I remember that Wittgenstein once told me of an incident in Tolstoy's life. When Tolstoy's brother died, Tolstoy, who was then a stern critic of the Russian Orthodox Church, sent for the parish priest and had his brother interred according to the Orthodox rite. Now, said Wittgenstein, that is exactly what I should have done in a similar case. When Drury mentioned this, everyone agreed that all the usual Roman Catholic prayers should be said by a priest at the graveside. Although Drury admits I've been troubled ever since as to whether what we did then was right. <laughs> Drury does not expand on this, but the trouble perhaps stems from the doubt as to whether the story about Tolstoy quite fits the occasion. For the point of the story is that although not himself an adherent to the Orthodox Church, Tolstoy had the sensitivity to respect his brother's death, his brother's faith. But in Wittgenstein's case, the position is reversed. It was Anscombe and Smithies and not he who adhered to the Catholic faith. Wittgenstein was not a Catholic. He said on a number of occasions, both in conversation and in his writings, that he could not bring himself to believe the things that Catholics believe. Nor, more important, did he practice Catholicism. And yet there seems to be something appropriate in his funeral being attended by a religious ceremony. For in a way that is centrally important but difficult to define, he lived a devoutly religious life. The reconciliation with God that Wittgenstein saw was not that of being accepted back into the arms of the Catholic Church. It was a state of ethical seriousness and integrity that would survive the scrutiny of even that most stern of judges, his own conscience the God who in my bosom dwells. Then I go on, that's the quote from Ray Monk, I go on to Peter Carley. That said, and while Wittgenstein was an intriguing human being with a fascinating life story, my seminar will do philosophical work, not biographical. I will present a refutation of those writers who have recently published the view that Rowan Williams is Wittgensteinian. My focus is the 2013 Gifford Lectures delivered by Bishop Rowan and subsequently published as The Edge of Words in 2014. I think that I will be doing Bishop Rowan a favour. If he can be considered Wittgensteinian, then he faces two immediate difficulties. First, there will be those who, will, who might accuse him of not being Wittgensteinian enough. In the alternative, and second, there could be those who argue that, at least at seminal points, he is slavishly Wittgensteinian and exposed to the routine philosophical objections to Wittgensteinianism. There is then a great deal riding on my argument as a non-Wittgensteinian. Let me repeat, I am a non-Wittgensteinian. 
<laughs> I did not expect, expect that you would attend this seminar I'm writing to Peter Carr. But I hope that it is gratifying to know that presentations of this kind are being made at an institution that benefits from your imminent involvement. Following the seminar, I will be forwarding to you the notes that I will address. I also have some correspondence about the matter that you will find significant. Do accept my best wishes. The correspondence about the matter will be the other book mm -hmm. from a, another retired Anglican Archbishop. So, I said we weren't going to do, do biography, we're going to do philosophical work, so here goes. Wittgensteinian grammar and theological limits. At Sydney University, my tutor in metaphysics was Professor Graham Nerlich in fourth year. And he once told me as a young undergraduate that the most significant problem in philosophy was to identify how language latched on to reality, how language represented reality, how language referred to reality, if it does. Shortly after he said that to me, I learned a much more sophisticated way of putting it. But he was speaking only to a young undergraduate, which is why he said what he did. The more sophisticated way of putting it is not to ask the question, what must language be like if it's going to represent reality? The much more sophisticated question is, what must reality be like if language is to be meaningful? Now, Bertrand Russell famously published an article called On Denoting, which appeared in the Philosophy Journal Mind of 1905. He considered an approach to certain language that appeared to denote reality, but which does not. Such as the phrase, the King of France, in the sentence, the King of France is bald. Uh, Russell understood the difference between denotation and connotation, meaning and reference. For the early Vic, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, though, who shortly after Russell's paper was published, became Russell's uh, student at Cambridge. For the Wittgenstein of the first and only published document in his lifetime, what is called the Tractatus, for that Wittgenstein, language presented a picture of reality. And meaning was bestowed by the determinate referent, even atomistic function of language. That is, language picks out aspects of reality and presents them as a picture. Names have reference and propositions have sense. Sounded right to Wittgenstein in 1921. But following the prompting of numerous critics, Wittgenstein soon found that to be defective. The bounds of sense are not empirical. To say that a word has no meaning when nothing corresponds to it is to confuse meaning, connotation, with reference, denotation. And we can talk about fairies meaningfully, and we can also talk about subatomic particles meaningfully. Further, additional criticisms of Wittgenstein in the Tractatus, it makes no sense to speak of an absolute correspondence between the symbols of language and those of reality. And a proposition does not necessarily become more clear by being broken down into its symbols. The later Wittgenstein, the Wittgenstein published as Philosophical Investigations in 1953, two years following his death, considered that meaning is use. Meaning has the virtue of being, uh, uh, language has the virtue of being used and its meaning is derived from that use. So there is Wittgenstein in a thumbnail sketch for you, Jonathan, trying to keep myself within your time frame. 
<coughs> Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, an Austrian, German-speaking, son of uh, the uh, enormously rich Wittgenstein family who controlled the steel industry in Europe prior to the First World War. We turn now to Dowie Zephyrmeyer Phillips, a Welsh philosopher from Swansea. His name is either Dowie or Duffet, both of them meaning David. And we will then talk about Rowan Williams, who may be a bit more familiar to you. Now, when I was at Sydney University, we had a visit from a Eben, eminent English philosopher, Anthony Quinton. He was so em eminent as a philosopher that he was raised to a peerage under Margaret Thatcher. He was Lord Quinton of Oxford. Very fine chap. Visited Sydney, invited by the philosophy faculty to give a paper. When the paper was over, and you'll have to understand, Sydney philosophers take no prisoners. <laughs> Uh, when the paper was over, the first person to speak was Professor David Stove. And he said, well, Mr. Quinton, that's all very well, uh, but can you please tell us who you're arguing against? <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you who I'm arguing against. The reason why I'm telling you is these people are all public. They think that Rowan Williams is Wittgensteinian. And this is a public refutation of that proposition. I'm not going to take their assertions apart seriatim. I'm going to prove to you that no one can consider Rowan Williams a big constant. But who are these people? Who am I arguing against to satisfy Professor David Stove? Now, these people range over recent years from Williams's British biographer, a fellow called Rupert Short, in 2008, to a book on Williams's theology in 2012 by the Australian Benjamin Myers, a 27 September 2014 Spectator article by theologian Theo Hobson, an article in New Blackfriars 2017 by Brian McKinley who is also the author of a, of a Charles Sturt doctoral thesis awarded in 2020, supervised by the previously mentioned Benjamin Myers. In one way or another, all of those people are published as saying that Williams is Wittgensteinian. But instead of ranging over those several disparate writers, it might be more forensic for our purposes to make a mere triangular comparison and usher this Welsh Wittgensteinian DZ Phillips into the conversation. Unlike many commentators, he at least is a credible philosopher and Williams makes reference to him. Some, like the eminent and universally recognised Phillips, are indisputably Wittgensteinian. Hand on heart, DZ Phillips is Wittgensteinian. That does not mean that their understanding of Wittgenstein is agreed, let alone always beyond dispute, but they adhere to some elementary principles. They purport to treat examples of language as they find them, with respect. And they consider religious language to be sui generis. Religious language is unique. So we turn to the grammar of religious locution. And it's important to remember that depth grammar was part of the Tractatus, the only publication ever in Wittgenstein's lifetime, published in German in 1921 and in English in 1922. There for Wittgenstein, as Professor Kenny of Oxford has noted, philosophical analysis, analysis is needed to make the elements of propositions correspond to elements of thought and reveal the real logical form behind the appearances of ordinary speech. But what about Williams? For his part, Williams has quoted Wittgenstein 
a quote that has been repeated over and over and over again. Paragraph 373 of the Philosophical Investigations, which says, uh, grammar tells what kind of object anything is, to which Wittgenstein teasingly added in brackets, theology as grammar. Grammar tells what kind of object anything is, <coughs> theology as grammar. And Williams uh, explains Wittgenstein's point. There is a way of speaking about God which clearly cannot be speaking about God in Wittgenstein's eyes. By virtue of grammar, we have arrived at what might be called a theological truth. <coughs> Williams finds that Wittgenstein and Kierkegaard are like-minded in that regard. Williams quoting, uh, sorry, a quote from Williams in Christ, the Heart of Creation. Kierkegaard's concern is almost precisely the same anxiety about ways of speaking about God that are in fact grammatically incapable of doing what they purport to do. So what these, this suggestion is, is that it doesn't matter in whose mouth these locutions are being said, if grammar does not permit you to say them, you cannot say them. It doesn't matter how eminent you are. That is, some sentences intended with what proves to be an ungrammatical meaning are grammatically unsayable, to use a word from Rowan Williams. But at that point, we are still short of silence. The unsayable is still said, albeit without proper sense. Now here we might note Phillips' same sentiment where it is inappropriate to mean what you cannot mean by virtue of depth grammar, then you may not grammatically say what you want to say. We have arrived at a Wittgensteinian grammatical limit, perhaps prior to a locutionary limit, we have arrived at outrageous absurdity as, a, as opposed to ridiculous falsehood. And we all know what ridiculous falsehoods are like. If I was to say I'm 55, you'd say, not only is that false, it's ridiculous given your appearance. <laughs> Compared with that, there's outrageous absurdity. So if I was to say I am two-dimensional, that takes it beyond false. Uh, ridiculous falsehoods, and it becomes outrageous absurdity. So far, Williams and Phillips should agree that this is an acceptable characterization of something from Wittgenstein on one aspect of religious language. After all, this is to quote Williams quoting Wittgenstein. And Phillips would be considered by many to have consistently implemented one Wittgensteinian approach. For example, and positively, from Phillips, what I am suggesting is that to know how to use this language is to know God. Now Wittgenstein did not fully explain his notion of grammar, which is one of the most crushing criticisms that are made of those who are slavishly Wittgensteinian. Nevertheless, and second, the grammar of a locution is identifiable from the language used. And grammar tells what kind of object anything is, para 373 of the Philosophical Investigations. But it is the objects of language, such as chess rules or Newtonian laws, that grammar tells about, not atomistic reality of existence like chess pieces and billiard balls. This would be the idea behind Phillips' conviction that to say that X is a fact is to say something about the grammar of X. So we come to our broad question. Wittgenstein was Wittgensteinian. I don't say that lightly. Uh, some philosophers are not entirely slavish to their own point of view. So of a sort was Phillips. All Wittgensteinians are some sort of Wittgensteinian. 
But our focus is on Williams. Is Williams recognizably Wittgensteinian beyond those instances where he quotes Wittgenstein seemingly with approval? It must be said at the outset that the prospect of finding Williams to be Wittgensteinian is hardly promising. <coughs> this is one of the most disappointing aspects of the suggestion by those various people that I referred to earlier that they didn't begin at the beginning and ask the most obvious questions. Is it promising to propose that Williams is Wittgensteinian? The later Wittgenstein of the investigations, for example, considered that philosophy is a battle against the bewitchment by language of our intelligence. Grammar, not language, setting the bounds of sense. In other words, Wittgenstein thinks that language is trying to fool us. After all, for Wittgenstein, the nonsense of misconceived grammar is often disguised by language. By contrast with those seminal later Wittgensteinian notions, Williams regards as confused the idea that language itself is somehow an obstacle to proper and full truthfulness. For Wittgenstein, language is trying to fool us. For Williams, language is not an obstacle to discovering the truth. And that looks like a full-on collision at an elementary level. It was the first question to be addressed by any of those people who were saying, Rowan Williams is Wittgenstein. Further, in remembering that we are merely scratching the surface of our project, consider here that Williams does not overtly refer to Wittgenstein much at all. And given the wide range of influences on him beyond Merleau-Ponty, many listed in the preface to the edge of words, this despite another recent publication with a, an appendix partly on Wittgenstein. Now, what I've been talking about is Rowan Williams' 2013 Gifford Lectures in the University of, of, of Edinburgh, published the following year, 2014, as The Edge of Words. Subsequently, 2018, Rowan published Christ the Heart of Creation, which has as an appendix a postscript that is entitled Wittgenstein, Kierkegaard, and Chalcedon. You'd be interested in the reference to Chalcedon. Um, the point is that some people have seen the appendix of the second publication. Wittgenstein's in the heading. Wittgenstein is mentioned. Things like language and grammar pop up. And so they think, oh, this is a laid down Maser. <laughs> Williams is, is Wittgensteinian. But in, the, in that final appendix, uh, Williams described Wittgenstein as an unlikely and indirect exponent of classical Christology. Unlikely and indirect indeed, but this study was given at a meeting of the British Wittgenstein Society, the appendix in here, type in, with the Wittgenstein's name in the title, that paper was given at a meeting of the British Wittgenstein Society at Leeds in 2016. It was important enough for Williams to have it slightly modified, published a second time in another overtly Wittgensteinian context, an anthology of articles on Wittgenstein and religion edited by Michael Burley, published in 2018, the same year in which it appeared in that book. So three important instances, one a paper and another a repeat publication, albeit two particular presentations, an address and an article reproduced as an appendix on the same matter over the past decade, might be thought to be seminal for those who <coughs> claim Williams as Wittgensteinian. But from this material, should we? Well, no. And for two connected reasons. First, in this paper, reproduced twice, part of Williams's argument is to establish the debt that Wittgenstein owed to Kierkegaard. 
on the nature of religious statements and belief, the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard, who died in 1850. And second, Williams confirms his own dependence upon Kierkegaard in this regard. So Williams's paper to the 2016 conference of the British Wittgenstein Society <coughs> reproduced both in an anthology of, in 2018 of articles on Wittgenstein and as the appendix to Williams's Christ the Heart of, of Creation cannot be considered seminal for any submission that Williams is Wittgensteinian. So if you can't consider that appendix given as a paper to the British Wittgenstein Society and, and then reproduced twice, if you can't consider it a, an argument justifying the view that Rowan Williams is Wittgensteinian, those who think he's Wittgensteinian better find something else. And according to them, they have. And it is the Gifford Lectures, 2013, published as The Edge of Words in 2014. Now, uh, it, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit out of time, Jonathan. But uh, in order to address uh, our question, we're going to have a look at the edge of words, as is suggested by those who are promoting Williams as Wittgensteinian. <clears throat> Were there an absence of clear formal confession from Williams, and I say that very seriously, were there an absence of clear formal confession from Williams, one option would be to interrogate a significant publication from Williams, one that might reasonably be thought to reflect Wittgenstein if Williams is Wittgensteinian. And so we are going to examine the edge of words. In order to do so, and, it, and where it is desirable, it may make sense to allude to some kind of consonant Wittgensteinian position in approximate reference to what Williams calls, although Wittgenstein does not, the edge of words, and to see how closely Williams stands to Wittgenstein there. So we're going to do something triangular. Wittgenstein is Wittgensteinian. Gary Zephaniah Phillips is swear, hand on heart, Wittgensteinian. And we're going to complete the triangle by seeing whether Roman Williams can be accommodated in it. Crucially, Williams is interested in what he calls the frontier territories of our speech. A wilder and odder thing than we usually notice, he says. Note that Wittgenstein also once referred to a frontier. In those territories characterized by speech in the search for ways of making sense, strangeness, if not silence, looms for Williams. Thinking to the edge, there seems nothing further to be said, he says. But for Williams, that edge, adjacent to silence, accommodates the wild and the odd in his words. The unsayable and then silence might lie across it. Importantly, note that Williams's edge of speech embraces silence, but the limit of language is grammatical and necessarily locutionary for Wittgenstein, another gobsmackingly obvious difference between them. The question is then whether there may be an identifiable yet roughly symbiotic link in the understanding of Williams and the later Wittgenstein such that from both perspectives at times we can't go on in religious speech. Some kind of religious language frontier has been identified. So is that edge a theological limit? <laughs> One possible answer. Now it has been suggested that Williams is not concerned with a general theory of the limits of language. That was suggested by Rupert Dyers in his book. Indeed, let me emphasize that there are profound differences between the limit of language articulated by Wittgenstein and Phillips and Williams's conception of an edge of words. 
by way of initial suggestion that might be put that while <coughs> Wittgenstein's concept of nonsense does not embrace silence, Williams's strange, odd, and wild edge could, by virtue of theology's framework, encompass both wild locutions, perhaps even amounting to Wittgensteinian nonsense, qua Williams's concept of the unsayable, and silence. The quote from The Edge of Words, page 167, this is Williams. When we stop thinking, speaking, imaging, there is not so much a void as a plenitude. To recognize this is to recognize the strangeness of silence within speech as saying something that cannot be brought to words in the ordinary sense, representing what is not to be represented. Quote. The strangeness of silence, characterized by a plenitude, which means perfection of abundance, of what? The unrepresentable? Little wonder that Williams found the Wittgensteinian Phillips less than completely clear from this perspective. If silence is so strange, then none of us is clear in that dimension. We return then to Wittgenstein. It needs to be emphasized that there is a distinction between silence and the unsayable which is not a Wittgensteinian term, but a point with which we have been flirting. For the later Wittgenstein, ungrammatical nonsense is identifiable in, but has no application in, any language game. But Wittgenstein's grammatical limit, identifying nonsense, it must be suggested, does not encompass Williams's silence. Nonsense, not Indeed, what would be the Wittgensteinian grammar of Williams's silence? Here's an exercise. Let's see if we can identify the grammar of a period of silence. Beginning now. Beginning now. What was the grammar? What would be the Wittgensteinian grammar of Williams's silence? That might be a challenge both for Williams's embrace of a wordless religious plenitude and those who link Williams with Wittgenstein. Crucially, and to emphasize, for the later Wittgenstein to commit a grammatical error is to lapse into nonsense. And where a locution's grammatical status is not properly apprehended, failure to understand that grammar can result in, and this is in Wittgenstein's gorgeous terminology, going on holiday. You can imagine the meaning of the language you're using, packing up its bags and heading out the door with some hat on. Generating philosophical problems and withdrawing the locution from circulation. Condemned to complete silence? Wittgenstein didn't go that far. The ungrammatical for Wittgenstein remains identifiable. By comparison, for Williams, the situation is much more existential. It involves the moment where we examine the need to pause, acknowledging the issues or perspectives that cannot be dealt with within the framework we have started with. For Wittgenstein, framework is the scaffolding that enables operation of the language game, but Williams has not put it in language game terms like that. The by some purported Wittgensteinian Williams then allows that speech, including religious speech, can be wild and odd in frontier territories at the edge. I'll give you an example in that regard. Any statement about the resurrection, wild and odd. It is from Kierkegaard that Wittgenstein gets the idea that in order to believe in the resurrection, you don't need more facts. What you need is more love. It is love that convinces about the resurrection. That is this wild and odd dimension of theological language that a Wittgensteinian approach allows. But as Williams himself has pointed out, 
it is Wittgenstein having derived it from Kierkegaard. <coughs> We've already noted in the investigations that, fr that frontier is a term once used by Wittgenstein in the context of discussing limits. By contrast, as a universally recognized Wittgensteinian, Phillips considers that religion may not be wild unless it were to permit, which grammatically it will not, such a nonsense as descriptions of divine reality. That for Phillips would be unsayable in Williams's terms. And I have the significance of the question of whether Noah Williams is Wittgenstein is emerging. So, to, to finish, some final nonsense. In drawing this discussion to a close, we might concentrate on the important concept of nonsense. There is no reference to nonsense in the index to Williams as the engine words. But the exposure of nonsense is central to the later Wittgenstein's employment of grammar. Again, you would think these writers who published on this point would have noticed that. Philosophical employment of grammar for Wittgenstein is aimed at passing from disguised to patent nonsense. That is, it is profoundly Wittgensteinian to employ <coughs> grammar in exposing the nonsense of the ungrammatical language by depth grammar use. In stark contrast, Williams endorses the theological awareness of unmanageable paradoxes. But being in principle resolvable, Paradoxes are not what Wittgenstein was about in exposing patent nonsense, the unsayable in Williams's lexicon. For Williams, while theology does not offer to dissolve the paradoxes and ironies, or to name the unnameable, quote, Williams, theology will regard these sorts of speech as central to the enterprise of language using rather than marginal. And we'll have a framework in which what is present but unsayable is understood as pervasive and generative. And I submit that from what I have thought, Wittgenstein would be at least a stranger to that posture. Indeed, so would Phillips. An informative comparing Phillips and Williams then. For one, Phillips, an articulate, perhaps even clear Wittgensteinian idea about grammatical, non-cognitive nonsense limits to religious language. For the other, Williams, the proposal of an edge of wild and old speech, which might even be cognitive in, in intention, wherever silence does not prevail. An informative delineation, the thin edge of a widening wedge between them is emerging in plain view. And if Phillips is Wittgensteinian, which is universally accepted, then Williams cannot be. Indeed, and to proceed deductively past both Williams and Wittgenstein, for the early Wittgenstein, what lies beyond the limits of speech cannot be contemplated. There we must be silent. Indeed, for the later Wittgenstein, language, language games, grammar, and even <coughs> the identification of ungrammatical nonsense are available only before the limits of speech and thought are reached. And silence, perhaps not being subject to grammar, is just not an issue for Wittgenstein. By contrast, what lies beyond the edge for an apophatic Williams may be not merely an absence of religious speech, including the strange wild God, and an absence even of religious silence, but a void, presenting senseless, meaningless, religious thought. So, to conclude, to argue that Williams is Wittgensteinian, it would be necessary to show that both present significantly similar notions on seminal concepts. So do they? And the point I'm making here applies universally. It doesn't matter what your name is or when you published your point of view. This means that Williams cannot be Wittgensteinian. Crudely put, Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations lists nonsense, but not silence, in its index. Obviously, Williams's edge of words does not list nonsense, but does list 
silence. Now that's pretty basic and flat-footed, so we want to make a minimal move to sophistication. And there it can be observed that Wittgenstein <coughs> understands language to be potentially bewitching of our intelligence. Williams does not. This despite the fact that Williams considers that we are sometimes brought to silence in the search for sense. Wittgenstein considers that limits to language occur at the point of nonsense. Perhaps this could be well before complete silence is reached. Although Wittgenstein does not mention silence in the philosophical investigations. Without using the word nonsense, Williams accepts what might be understood as nonsense in the odd and wild frontier territory although perhaps similarly before complete silence is reached. The difference is that Williams perhaps tolerates varieties of what might be thought of as nonsense. Wittgenstein does not. Williams finds value in lapses into silence. By contrast, Wittgenstein interrogates the grammar of the locution under consideration in order to avoid nonsense. That is, for Wittgenstein, there's no place for nonsense in language games, but for Williams, something like religious nonsense might characterise frontier territory. Further, for Wittgenstein, grammar tells the sense of locutions, even theological locutions. Because grammar has no application in silence, there is nothing to be told from silence. In silence, by contrast, Williams finds potential existential understanding <coughs> of frontier limits to discourse, including religious discourse. In astringent point, if he were Wittgensteinian then, how would Williams characterise the grammar of silence? That would be nonsense. By way of an even more austere summary, can a scholar be Wittgensteinian without clearly subscribing to Wittgenstein on language, language games, and nonsense, or while proposing views that Wittgenstein did not hold on discourse limits and silence. Opportunity to engage Peter on that fascinating uh, paper, I'll take comments, questions, uh, clarifications, reflections, and challenges. Uh, Nicola, I think I saw your. Um, you have to forgive me, I'm not sure who was first. You could have uh, no, 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 a. He's my elder, so. <laughs> So how about, how about you, who wants to go first, and whoever can't go first can go second. You, you'll be explicitly brief and logical. I will. I'll be more discursive. So right. okay. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, as you were speaking, Peter, I couldn't but harken back to my childhood memory, which is very clear in Germany, of all places, Austria, when uh, I was four, and I was speaking to my grandparents and, and uh, uh, other family, and I can still visualize the scene. They were in the corner, and I was trying to explain something to them. And there were some words that I knew in German, and there were other words I, I knew what I was saying, but I didn't have a word for it. So I made up a word. And I became increasingly impatient and annoyed with them, because they kept thinking that I was really cute. And I wasn't being cute. I was actually seriously, uh, you know, backing up the gaps with words that meant what I wanted to say, but I didn't have a word. So I totally subscribed to the idea that sometimes what they thought was nonsense was in fact a very clear idea in my mind, which I had no words for at the time. And so I totally subscribed with, with the idea of silence and nonsense as, as having a grammar of its own. <laughs> so I'll just stop that. Thank you. Well, uh, one thing that you are going to have to carefully consider, mm -hmm. Nicola, is the Wittgensteinian argument against private privilege. <clears throat> yes, of course. Now, <clears throat> uh, 
Wittgenstein infuriates people because he is inconsistent. So he, he says, for example, in the, in the introduction to the Tractatus, whatever can be thought can be thought clearly. So he's a great advocate of what is clear, but he's completely unclear on language games and language games. And uh, it is just possible that you can sustain your own private language appreciation against Wittgenstein, but let me warn you, um, Wittgenstein's private language argument has been taken enormously productively by metaphysicians. Uh, a wonderful Catholic metaphysician at Oxford, Michael Dummett, has a theory of reality based on the outcome of Wittgenstein's uh, private uh, argument against private language. Do, uh, do you know of Michael Dummett's got? Yeah, not, not, not as much as I like. Uh, yeah. A very fine philosopher, an enormously talented Oxford philosopher, mm -hmm. uh, and a very faithful Catholic. Thanks for that. That's another one to go on the list. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to run with what you've what you've said, <coughs> and and my only uh, authority for doing it is I once took my wife for a day out in the in the remote suburbs of Vienna to visit House Wittgenstein, which he designed and built for his sister, yep. which is a modern a, a scarcely visited modernist triumph. Yes. So, you know, Wittgenstein has a kind of a a, a kind of a a mysticism for what's beyond words. You know, he says, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must remain silent. And yet there was all that Catholic business about his fear of being silent. So he admits that there might be something going on, but he doesn't want to. The same could be said of, of Jacques Derrida. For those who call him a mystic, mm. simply because nothing can be pinned down, mm. but that, that he must have some sense of something beyond <coughs> what can be, what can be you know, nailed down in the, um, and then, the, then you get the radical Wittgensteinian view against that, that, that there's nothing yeah. there at all. A, a sense of the uncanny, of the transcendent, of something more, is just the sort of sputtering, sparking we see at the edge of our language yeah. that suggests that, that this is just the breakdown of our mental capacities. Yeah. And that's all the transcendence is. It's a sense that you know, we, just can't, yeah. we just can't fathom anything, really. Yeah. But with, with Rowan, you get a stronger sense than, than that. that there, really is, there really is something there, and it can be reached out into thanks to the resources that we have within the language, within our participation in Christian scripture and liturgy. Christ, the grammar of Christian faith gives us, gives the, the grammar of, Christ, of the language, of Christianese, if you like, gives us capacities to articulate silence and emptiness and hurt and evil and violence and all the other all, all the other visceral things yeah. that can't be rationally plumbed and yet we can somehow inhabit them and deal with them. And, and I guess my prob my problem with the with the position that you're putting is that Wittgenstein's referring to general language, the sort of language you hear in the shops of Cambridge or in the primary schools in Austria. But Rowan's referring specifically to the, the, the language of Christian faith and practice, the language of scripture and liturgy. And, and it, it's, it's a culture and a language that's quite specific. And my sense is that Wittgenstein's more about a kind of a linguistic Esperanto, whereas Rowan and other theologians like von Balthasar, who he translates, and Robert Jensen in America are talking about the specific grammar of Christian language. <clears throat> Scott, you have unerringly put your finger on a very significant point, mm -hmm. and one on which th we're not going to find agreement on the two sides. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, uh, from the 1960s onward, it was um, argued quite strongly that what Wittgenstein was saying in the Tractatus is, Here's what happens if you try and link language to reality. But guess what? That's not the important thing. What's the most significant thing is what we can't talk about. 
and, and hence we have the last aphorism of the Tractatus, whereof we cannot speak there, we must be silent. Okay? So there are those, and, there, and that school has been with us for 60 or 70 years, of saying even in the Tractatus, what Wittgenstein is on about, is not the positivist uh, agenda for language and reality, it's a more, much more mystical thing. The answer to that kind of proposal um, is to say that what the Tractatus is about is the logical scaffolding that presents the logical nature of language. And if that is the case, then the Tractatus applies to all language. The, the a fly in the ointment is, as you have indicated towards is that by the time we get to the investigations we have meaning as use and we do have this profound respect for different kinds of language that is theology is so generous so um, it's a it's an ongoing debate I, of course uh, the most sophisticated thing to do is to try and straddle both sides um, but you are, from, depending on what point of your sentence you're at in talking about these things, you are going to have to decide what's my attitude to the Tractatus and silence and what's my attitude to the investigations and silence. And um, my own view is that I look at the Tractatus very technically and I, and I don't subscribe to that view which began in the 60s with David Pears and Co about the most important thing for Wittgenstein in the, in the Tractatus is what's not written in the Tractatus. I don't subscribe to that at all. But I think that the seventh aphorism is about what we cannot say, we, there, there we must be silent, is what we have said about the logical structure of language. There is a view that what he's saying there in the last aphorism is to say all the foregoing I'm not able to say. And I've just demonstrated why I'm not. <coughs> and I'm very tempted, I'm very tempted down that track. Here's a question from a non-philosopher. Yes. I'm very sorry, I only did one year at Sydney Uni and I was lectured by Stoven Eric, but it didn't sink in the way it did with you. Yeah. <laughs> just, but just listening to you overall, yeah. I just have a, a question genuinely to ask you. Mm. You did talk, for example, you started talking about Wittgenstein's life and so on. Yes. Now, you know, I, don't, I know a tiny wing a little bit about him, and he was obviously ancestrally Jewish, and as many, most Central Europeans were, um, as it were, either forcibly or semi voluntarily converted to Catholicism, which always left a veneer, so of interest in religion, um, while it was perfectly possible to have a wistfulness towards it but still be agnostic, but still be trying to come to terms with what the language of religion required. I don't know if my new friend over there will agree with me, obviously being Austrian, so I'll defer to you. German. Sorry, German. German. Yeah. Um, now, in your very well delivered lecture, you referred, for example, to Wittgenstein's debt to Kierkegaard, which is perfectly understandable. I know I don't think ideas arrive out of nowhere because I'm just one. You might think they do, but they arrive out of magnificent brains. But I tend to think they come from somewhere. Yep. So Wittgenstein's own thought result, as you said several times, you talked about the later Wittgenstein and the fact that his actual writings were mostly set down for his death anyway, and so on. Is it possible? And I'm only asking this, mm. since clearly Williams would have had quite a considerable acquaintance with the works of Wittgenstein. He must have given his erudition. Is it possible that in some ways he's unconsciously Wittgensteinian? Well, maybe not in the start where you're maybe, you know, he's not coming I mean, face to face with it, but would it not have permeated his thought in some way? In which case, is there an unconscious element there? No, I don't know. I'm only answering it. It's certainly possible to be unconsciously one thing or another. Yes. And is he not, or can he be? I don't know. The, the sort of thought that I would respond to that suggestion is uh, if you think that somebody is Wittgensteinian and grammar is so significant for Wittgenstein, 
you're going to have to show how they use grammar, how they acknowledge the uh, that grammar as a device, depth grammar. Um, and uh, the word grammar um, appears half a dozen times in the appendix to the Christ the Heart of Creation. But I find it very difficult in Williams to find the word grammar. So you think Williams really doesn't come to terms or doesn't agree with how to speak in thinking, if that's what you're saying? Well, I'm just giving you grammar as one example. Um, if you're going to start talking about grammar, you then have to talk about language games. And you have to talk about rules of language games. And there's a, there's a whole, there's a theology that, okay, and there's a Wittgensteinian theology. You get, you get on board and it just, the train takes off and you're stuck with all that stuff. You can't say, I'm Wittgensteinian, but I don't go, with, I, don't, I don't subscribe to him on depth grammar. You can't say, I'm Wittgensteinian, but I'm not, happy with uh, language games. But his mother's judging to be subconsciously. <coughs> but is it, just, is it just a matter of the fact that the linguistic turn in 20th century philosophy is taken up in one way or another by so many philosophers subsequently? So, so we're, you could say that you know, we're all descendants of Wittgenstein in one way or another. Yes, we are, in the, in the way that uh, Peter Carnley said that in Cambridge in the 1960s, the place was to think with it. Mm. And Wittgenstein had died um, only eight years earlier. And, uh, and you, you simply couldn't avoid uh, the, the Wittgenstein in the air. I mean, this, is, this man was a cult figure in Cambridge. This is the sort of academic whose students dress like <laughs> you know. Um, so that that was the nature of the, of, of the university uh, that Wittgenstein was hu hugely influential. Because um, he got him out of sterile empiricism, didn't he? Which not by the Tractatus, he didn't. No, and, no, no, and he reckoned that those who didn't read it that way got it wrong. Yeah. Yes, his latest stuff. Yeah. Yes. But Peter, he should have rescued us who had to parse everything in year five and six. Parsing my like pages every weekend I was parsing. That is delicious. Isn't it? <laughs> I love parsing. I did I too. I got to love it. And then when I taught language, I thought, my God, I'm, I'm streaks ahead of these poor other people. <laughs> exactly. It's empowering. Empowering. We're uh, coming up against time. So, Alice had, had a question. Well, my no, question is really just what was going to be the second minute. I'm about to give it when, as soon as Jonathan, did. as soon as Jonathan gives me the mod. Okay, yeah, I thought I thought you'd abandoned that. Scott, <laughs> Scott. <laughs> Let, let's have uh, Scott. Um, uh, must you leave? I must. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to leave soon as well for and another meeting. Well, well, let's let's hear from Let me Alice. Give you. I'll, I'll, Alice I'll, first. I'll that's it. Oh, okay. But I'm sure Peter. No, but can't you just ask it? Oh well, I, I just wanted to ask whether you'd be prepared to characterise what um, the people who claim Rowan Williams is a Wittgensteinian, what it is they're trying to achieve by this. Mm. Um, but you can answer that maybe later. Mm. I, I think part of the answer there is that for some people, Wittgenstein's the only game in town, and so they think Wittgenstein's you, beaut. And if they can say Rowan Williams is you, they've flattered him. But in fact, as I'm saying, you haven't flattered him at all because you're stuck with all the objections to Wittgensteinianism. So I think it comes, I don't want to be too right on this here, but I, I think it comes out of people not understanding Wittgenstein and perhaps not having the <coughs> world from Williams carefully enough either. Jonathan, I'll give my book in. Yeah, let's hear it. I wrote to Rowan Williams. Now, if you are going to claim that Rowan Williams is big and stimulant, what's the first thing you would do? Ask him. Seems <laughs> <laughs> like a logical thing. As far as I can gather, none of the people I've talked about have ever asked him. I wrote to him. Dear Bishop Rowan, you were kind enough to provide your email address. In response, I sent a draft of the points to which I might speak at a seminar in Canberra next August. I certainly do not wish to trouble you, but I would be most grateful for your advice 
whether you identify as Wittgensteinian, it is central to my remarks. Of course, my concern is only to have your indication for the sake of the seminar. While I am myself not Wittgensteinian, similar, say, to D.Z. Phillips, I have derived very considerable benefit from him. You may be similar in orientation. For your assistance, I've attached my revised draft notes with every good wish, trusting you are well, Peter. The dear man responded straight away. Dear Peter, this is from Rome. Forgive my tardy response. It's been a busy season. Yes, I saw him in the congregation at the coronation and the coming <laughs> early. But I was very grateful to read your seminar outline which seemed to me broadly accurate. In a nutshell, no, I wouldn't call myself a Wittgensteinian. <laughs> Certainly not in quite the sense that Dully Phillips was. I don't go much in for self-contained schools of philosophy at the best of times. But Dully, Zephaniah Phillips, and Wittgenstein most definitely taught me to think and to think about thinking about language and its protocols and practices was essential. In all sorts of local issues, I take for granted much of what Wittgenstein argued. And I find his challenges to some sorts of philosophical orthodoxy very important. Not least in epistemology, you'll have noticed the importance of Stanley <coughs> Cavell for me. Stanley Cavell is a contentious Harvard philosopher who some people in Australia hate and some love. But I was never sure what Darwin really thought about the reality of God. And that is very Wittgensteinian, to be unsure about the reality of God. And Darwin Phillips is Wittgensteinian. And Rowan is fine. Aspects of his work, that is Phillips, help me in responding to Don Cupid's anti-realism, Don Cupid being an uncompromised at Cambridge. And I never thought Dowie belonged in that camp in any straightforward way, but I wanted to get back at some point to a more metaphysical register. That is, Rowan is interested in talking about the reality of so Wittgenstein was, is a key critical presence, providing a range of questioning methods and some crucial bits of philosophical demythologizing, but not the end of the business. I hope this helps. You deserve a longer and fuller response. But I'm slightly swamped with things at present. Do let me know if you're developing this further. With sincere thanks for doing me the honor of discussing what I've read. Uh, I have to say it is to develop further. This is the very brief notes from a, a much longer paper. Um, I'll be sending the paper uh, to uh, Rowan and also to Peter Carnley. And uh, who knows, we might uh, by email get a little discussion going uh, with a couple of retired archbishops. <laughs> Well, that brings our lecture to a close. Thank you so much, Peter. Let's show him our appreciation. And look out for our next lecture sometime in September. Thank you very much. Now is the time for me to Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much. Nice to see you. Nice to see you.